NAGPRA is a human rights statute. It is a process. It's a tool. Level playing field uh, and uh, bring the ancestors back home. It's about relationships. NAGPRA is civil rights legislation. NAGPRA itself outlines the expectation of tribes and museums. A reconciliation that they were not collectibles, that they were not specimens, but they were uh, they were uh, ancestors of people who are alive now. Welcome to the video series on the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, presented by the National NAGPRA Program of the National Park Service. My name is David Tarler, and I'll be your guide to the topics in this segment on the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Review Committee. The Review Committee was created by Congress to advise both the Secretary of the Interior and Congress on the implementation of NAGPRA. At the time of this recording, I have the honor of serving as the designated federal official to the Review Committee. In this segment, you're going to hear from past and present Review Committee members about committee membership and responsibilities. You'll watch an actual dispute before the Review Committee, along with the committee's deliberation, findings of fact, and recommendations. And you'll listen to members' personal perspectives on such things as working relationships, consensus, and emerging issues in NAGPRA. I hope that at the end of this segment, you'll understand the role that the Review Committee plays in NAGPRA and the ways that the committee can assist you with the NAGPRA compliance process. When it enacted NAGPRA in 1990, Congress directed the Secretary of the Interior to establish a committee to monitor and review the implementation of the inventory and identification process and repatriation activities required under Sections 5, 6, and 7 of the Act. Congress intended for the Review Committee to furnish expert advice, ideas, and opinions on NAGPRA matters to the Secretary, who was given the responsibility for overseeing NAGPRA implementation on the national level. As an advisory committee having no federal employees, the Review Committee operates under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA. Among other things, FACA requires the committee to have a charter. You can find the NAGPRA Review Committee's charter by logging on to the National NAGPRA Program's website and clicking on Review Committee. To conform with FACA's requirement of fair balance in terms of points of view represented on an advisory committee, the seven-member committee established by NAGPRA requires that three of its members be appointed by the Secretary of the Interior from nominations submitted by Indian tribes, Native Hawaiian organizations, and traditional Native American religious leaders. Two of those members must be traditional Indian religious leaders. Three of the remaining members must be appointed from nominations submitted by national museum organizations and scientific organizations. Let's have a few review committee members introduce themselves. My name is Eric Hemenoy. I'm an Anishinaabe from Cross Village, Michigan. I work for Little Charles Bay Band of Odell Indians located in Harbor Springs, Michigan, and I am on the review committee. Uh, it's been my pleasure and honor to serve on the review committee for two terms or five years. Uh, I also served as its chair for three years. My name is Sonia Atalai. I'm Nishnabe Ojibwe from Michigan, grew up in Michigan, and um, I'm an assistant professor at Indiana University in Anthropology and Native American and Indigenous Studies, and I'm newly appointed member to the NAGPRA Review Committee. In addition to the six appointees nominated by Native, Museum, and Scientific points of view, there is a seventh member who is appointed by the Secretary from a list of persons developed and consented to by the other members. Here's one consensus member's view on the role of the at-large committee member. I think I do see my role a bit differently, and I'm not sure whether it's that I'm the consensus member or it, it is the result of my background, but I see my role to assist the members of the committee 
to find a common ground to reach a resolution of issues, whether they be procedural or administrative or even just factual issues. I, I, I see my role as being there to help all of them do what they do best, which is to bring their disciplines and their experience into the committee. The first responsibility for the review committee listed in the act is to designate one of its members as the chair. The chair collaborates with the designated federal official on establishing procedures for conducting review committee business, consults with the DFO on meeting agendas, conducts public meetings, including hearings, deliberations, motions, fact-finding, and recommendations, signs findings of fact and recommendations by the review committee for publication in the Federal Register, and serves as the conduit for communications to the review committee from National NAGPRA program staff. More on the role of the chair is provided by Rosita Worrell, herself a review committee chair. Well, the chair is responsible for facilitating review committee discussions, keeping the discussions focused on the current actions before the committee, bringing issues to the committee that emerged in earlier committee discussions, assessing ways to improve the efficiencies of, of committee actions, and then also working with the designated federal official on minutes, uh, agendas, and disputes that may become before the committee. What happens if an Indian tribe has requested the repatriation of what it believes to be a culturally affiliated item, but the museum or federal agency has neither accepted nor rejected their written request? What happens if a museum or federal agency feels the need for an expert opinion on whether the information in the tribe's repatriation request shows cultural affiliation by a preponderance of the evidence? Or what happens if a question arises as to whether a NAGPRA item fits more than one category. In those kinds of cases, the review committee can help to keep the NAGPRA process on track for tribes, Native Hawaiian organizations, museums, and federal agencies alike. Section 8C3 of NAGPRA states that the review committee shall be responsible for, upon the request of any affected party, reviewing and making findings related to a. The identity or cultural affiliation of cultural items, or B. The return of such items. You can find the Section 8C3 Review and Findings Procedures on the National NAGPRA Program website. What happens if an Indian tribe requests the repatriation of a cultural item and believes it has satisfied all the criteria for a request, but the museum or federal agency disagrees? What happens if the museum agrees that the request satisfies the criteria, but the tribe and the museum disagree over whether the museum has the right of possession? In those kinds of cases, the review committee is authorized to apply its fact-finding and recommendation responsibilities toward facilitating the resolution of any dispute relating to the return of a NAGPRA item, and this includes convening the parties to the dispute. You're about to view excerpts from a dispute convened by the Review Committee in October 2008. The parties are the Onondaga Nation, a constituent member of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the New York State Museum. The dispute involved the cultural affiliation, or lack thereof, of the remains of 180 Native American individuals that had been in the possession of the New York State Museum since 1989. The human remains had been removed in 1967 and 1968 during the construction of an expressway in New York State. In 1998, the museum determined that these 180 individuals were culturally unidentifiable, as that term is used in the law. But in 2007, the Onondaga Nation requested repatriation of these individuals and presented the museum with information that it believed showed cultural affiliation between the nation and the human remains. In rejecting the nation's request, the museum responded that the Onondaga had not shown cultural affiliation 
by a preponderance of the evidence. The Onondaga Nation, in turn, disputed the determination of the New York State Museum and asked the review committee to convene the parties and hear the dispute. The chair of the review committee agreed. And so in October 2008, the review committee was asked to make findings of fact and recommendations on whether the relevant information presented by the Onondaga Nation showed that, more likely than not, a relationship of shared group identity could reasonably be traced between the nation and the 180 individuals. Let's look at some excerpts from the party's presentations to the review committee. First up is the Onondaga Nation. So the museum's story ends that um, that there's, there's no way this um, older component, the Lake Woodland component, could be affiliated with Onondaga Nation or anybody else. Um, that absol it's absolutely disconnected. It's absolutely existing in a vacuum by itself. There are no roots. There are no branches. And Onondaga somehow got to be Onondaga arising out of the same vacuum. They don't recognize the connection. And I believe their story doesn't recognize the connection is because all they've relied on is archaeological and limited historical evidence. They, their archaeology says that it's just inconclusive. But that doesn't end the story. That's one piece of evidence. That's one part that we look at. The other evidence supports affiliation. The geography, the history, the oral tradition, the kinship relations. It all supports affiliation. Next, we'll watch the New York State Museum's rebuttal. I'm going to briefly summarize what uh, was distributed this morning, a written statement about the museum's position on the uh, cultural, the fact that we believe the Engelbert site is culturally unidentifiable. Uh, the Engelbert site and the people who live there have a complex story with, in our opinion, two big questions. Who were they and who speaks for them now? We recognize the Onondaga Nation has an interest in the Engelbert site, and we hope to find a resolution to its disposition. After reviewing the available evidence, including geographic, kinship, biological, archaeological, linguistic, folklore, oral tradition, and historical evidence, we have found that the Engelbert people have ties with many nations, including the Onondaga Nation, but also other Haudenosaunee nations and Algonquin-speaking groups like the Delaware and heard the Onondaga Nation present oral traditional evidence in order to argue for cultural affiliation of the 180 individuals with the nation. And you saw and heard the New York State Museum present archaeological and historical documentary evidence to rebut cultural affiliation. Now, NAGPRA accords all these categories of evidence equal relevance. It's up to the review committee as the fact finder to then weigh that evidence. As somebody who is uh, deeply concerned with how one interprets biological information, uh, I, I know that frequently questions of cultural affiliation or questions of whether or not uh, an individual, a group of individuals are Native American, uh, it's, it is a question of cultural affiliation, not biological affiliation, but it's interesting that biological data are often really looked upon as being one of the most important sources of information um, to try to make that determination. And I'm actually interested both in, in how that information is used, whether or not it's properly used, and also the question of whether or not it's overly inter over-interpreted. And I, it's, for me, it's very important to look at the biological information, but also to look at it in proper archaeological and cultural context. So that's one of the things that I frequently end up asking questions about and really concerned about. Uh, first of all, let me say that I very much appreciate that NAGPRA itself gave legitimacy and credence to the value of oral traditions. Uh, it gives it equal weight to other scientific evidence. 
We have to remember that not all knowledge has been collected by anthropologists, archaeologists, historians, or other casual observers. However, we do have a significant body of oral traditions that have survived throughout the Americas, and oral traditions are a legitimate body of evidence that can be brought to bear in determining such issues as cultural affiliation. Now let's watch the review committee's deliberation. I mean, it's, it's, it's natural that in, in a situation like this, everyone sort of focuses on the evidence that they know best or that is closest to them in some fashion. You know, so I think this is a situation where uh, everyone is acting in good faith and, and people are looking at the facts and at the law and kind of disagreeing about where the chips fall. And, and, and um, you know, NACRA... <coughs> Um, forces us into making a dichotomous judgment. It's either culturally affiliated or it's not culturally affiliated. It's a kind of an either or, a yes or no. You might wonder whether in matters such as a dispute between a tribe and a museum, the review committee members are supposed to only represent the interest of those that nominate them. This is their response. Once you get on the committee, you, you don't just represent the individual, the group that nominated you, the group that nominated you, but you, you're representing you know, the, a, a larger question and a larger whole. And I think everybody has taken that sense of broader representation seriously and has really tried to go for, you know, what is the just, you know, what is a scientifically correct and just solution to a particular problem? What was the outcome of the dispute between the Onondaga Nation and the New York State Museum? The motion is, I move to committee find that based on the preponderance of the evidence, there is a relationship, a shared group of identity between the Onondaga and Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Inglebert remains of given this relationship, the New York State Museum should expeditiously, uh, expeditiously repatriate the Inglebert remains to the Onondaga. Any further discussion on that, on that motion? Are you ready for the motion? Call the question. The question's been called for. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Um, that, that motion passes. Uh, and we do have one, one opposition. Among the six review committee members in attendance, Five agreed that the preponderance of the evidence showed that there was a cultural affiliation between the 180 Native American individuals and the Onondaga Nation. A notice of the review committee's findings of fact and recommendations was signed by Chair Rosita Worrell, and it was duly published in the Federal Register. On April 2, 2009, the New York State Museum published a notice of inventory completion in the Federal Register. The notice said that, based on expert opinion, the museum had determined that a relationship of shared group identity could reasonably be traced between the 180 individuals and the Onondaga Nation. The expert opinion relied on by the, by the museum were the findings of fact made by the review committee after hearing the dispute. Since the publication of that Federal Register notice, these culturally affiliated individuals have been transferred to the possession and care of the Onondaga Nation.
Shannon Keller O'Loughlin, an attorney who represented the Onondaga Nation before the Review Committee, has talked about the experience of using the Review Committee to facilitate a dispute. Going through the NAGPRA Review Committee process was very much worth um, the time and the effort because what it did was provide a lot of education um, to me as an attorney and also to nation representatives who do this kind of work of exactly what we need to do and what rights we have under NAGPRA to move a repatriation forward. And um, also by attending the review committee meetings, um, we had an opportunity to interact a lot with other nations uh, from around the country, which is always a learning process. And it continues to remind me uh, why this work is so important. You can find the Section 8C4 dispute procedures and read all the review committee's dispute findings on the National NAGPRA program website. There have been more than 124,000 individuals who could not be culturally affiliated on the basis of a reasonable belief. At the time of this taping, we still await a regulation that will address the disposition of these culturally unidentifiable human remains, sometimes called CUI. Meanwhile, museums and federal agencies must retain possession of these CUI unless they are legally required to do otherwise, or are recommended to do otherwise by the Secretary of the Interior. As a result, museums and federal agencies have entered into agreements with tribes for the disposition of these CUI, and together they have asked the Review Committee to consider those agreements and recommend to the Secretary of the Interior that he or she permit the disposition to occur. Several review committee members have spoken about dealing with culturally unidentifiable Native American human remains. Yeah, I'm very interested in the culturally unidentifiable human remains. And my sense is that as NAGPRA went forward, it was not perhaps anticipated that such a large percentage of individuals that had were determined to be Native American, Native Hawaiian, would be considered culturally unidentifiable. On the other hand, it does make some sense because it's very hard to make a determination of specific cultural affiliation, especially when a group or, or individual is beyond the period of you know, known historic European cont contact, and that is the vast majority of them. What I'm really pleased about is the processes that seem to be unrolling in which groups of Native Americans are coming together, affiliations, regional consortiums are coming together and beginning to make requests to the review committee for, for, for deposition and repatriation. The review committee has wrestled along with the Department of Interior with the complex issues regarding disposition of those remains, and the development of um, draft regulations pertaining to it, and the development of particularly of, of methods and protocols by which both tribes and museums or federal agencies or universities can uh, go through a process in which uh, cultural affiliation or potential affiliation is identified with a set of remains with the procedural methods by which there is a consensus reached among tribes that may have an affiliation to unidentified remains. Eric Hemingway, a repatriation specialist for his tribe, the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians, and now a review committee member, has reviewed disposition agreements from both sides of the table. I work primarily doing research and repatriation for Little Traverse Bay. And just through working for my tribe, I started to gain um, additional knowledge about the disposition process. And I started to bring that back to Michigan. And this all happened at my first review committee meeting I went to. And I was very new to my position, and I didn't really know what NAGPRA was, but I liked the idea of stuff coming back to tribes. And I told my boss, I think it'd be a pretty good idea if I go to this review committee meeting. Sounds like a lot of stuff goes on. So she's like, okay, yeah, you know, just get the tra travel arranged and we'll send you out. And that was in 
2007 in spring meeting in D.C. And I went out, you know, without any expectations. I didn't know what to, you know, really expect. And, and at the meeting, I seen these other tribes presenting these disposition cases, so, uh, CUIs. And this is something that was being worked on for years within Michigan with the tribes there. And it's just like a light went on. It's like, how come these tribes are getting these culturally unidentifiable remains back? And the tribes in Michigan haven't. And the museums are always telling us, you know, these are not going back. It's impossible. Forget about it. So it was like a really, like, big idea, a revelation almost, to go back and say to my fellow tribes in Michigan, it's like, hey, guess what? We can get these back. This is the process. And I immediately got on the horn, started calling museums, saying, you know, I know you have these remains, and they are categorized as such, but if you would be willing to work with the tribes, and I say tribes, not just little Travers, because this would be a, a team effort, a group effort of all the tribes in Michigan and outside of Michigan, that um, there's a process that allows for you to return these remains if you so choose. And they asked me, well, have you done this before? And the first time I said no, but I've seen it done, so I know it can be done. And uh, after the first one, you know, it went, real, the first one was the roughest, but after that, you know, we, we got our process down. And museums in Michigan and outside of Michigan have been real receptive. At the instruction of the review committee, staff at the National NAGPRA program created an organizational form and checklist for museums and federal agencies to use when they submit materials to the review committee and request the committee's recommendation that a disposition go forward under an agreement. This form can be downloaded from the National NAGPRA program website. You've already heard that the review committee operates under the Federal Advisory Committee Act in order to advise the Secretary of the Interior. But it also is tasked with keeping Congress informed on NAGPRA issues. The Act requires the Review Committee to submit an annual report to Congress on NAGPRA implementation. In these annual reports, the Review Committee makes recommendations on how Congress can help improve the progress on implementing the law. You can read these reports to Congress by going to the National NAGPRA Program website. The first meeting of the Review Committee took place in Washington, D.C in April of 1992. Those early days are recounted by two review committee members, Dan Monroe and Martin Sullivan. There was suspicion from the very beginning that it was yet uh, another uh, device, uh, in this case to be used by the National Park Service as a means of, of, uh, uh, of um, exerting its own influence, having its own way, if you will. Uh, with the process and creating a sort of sham group uh, to rubber stamp uh, what was going to be coming out of uh, the Park Service anyway. Uh, I think that that was a very early impression which was proven wrong. It was proven wrong in part uh, by uh, the selection of those who served on the review committee who did represent that spectrum of uh, which the law required of traditional religious leaders and tribal leaders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The first few meetings of uh, the review committee were, were, really, were very challenging. I mean, there were, on all, ref all fronts, there was not clear understanding of uh, the law in all quarters. Um, there were representatives of the tribes that uh, expected things to move forward with a very rapid pace and in a way that the law really didn't provide for, representatives of the scientific and museum community that were suddenly faced with the reality of federal legislation that was very specific. And, um, and there was a lot of uncertainty regarding certain provisions of the law that where there were no regulations promulgated. and. Uh, it was intense, very intense. Fortunately, those initial suspicions were short-lived, as the committee members embraced the value of consensus and what they saw as the spirit of NAGPRA. The review committee has played a very important role in terms of helping uh, museums deal with complex issues, which in 
are inevitably involved in NAGPRA and to deal with them in ways that uh, not only fulfill the law to the letter, but also fulfill the spirit of the law. Rosita Wuerl has had a long tenure on the review committee for much of that time as chair. When asked how she would describe her contributions to the review committee, here's what she said. Um, I believe that my contributions together with the review committee members with whom I have served include improving the efficiency of the way the review committee conducts business, including the timeliness of our reports to Congress, establishing clear procedures for review committee actions, outlining the expectations of the review committee in procedures for the tribes and the museums who bring disputes and disposition requests to the review committee, establishing a history of dispute findings made by the review committee, also advocating to clear the backlog of notices and regulations that had accumulated in the NAGPRA program, also establishing good working relationship with the NAGPRA program staff by outlining the review committee actions and its expectations. The review committee still has much work ahead of it. Some regulations remain to be promulgated, and the review committee will continue to consult with the Secretary of the Interior on their development. Even after it is promulgated, the rule on culturally unidentifiable human remains will not entirely eliminate the need for disposition agreements and requests for recommendations to the Secretary on dispositions. And in the near term, there will be disputes among tribes, museums, and federal agencies, as well as the need for findings of fact and recommendations. Also, when new issues in NAGPRA emerge, the Secretary of the Interior has the ability to assign the Review Committee the task of addressing them in an advisory capacity. Dan Monroe foresees one emerging issue of particular interest. Unfortunately, non-federally recognized tribes um, don't have standing under NAGPRA. And the Review Committee has sought at various times to try to, to deal with that. And there have been uh, repatriations that have occurred with non-federally recognized tribes that are connected to NAGPRA, but not officially or formally a part of the, of, uh, the NAGPRA process. Given the weight of the tasks to be performed and the time demanded in order to address them, why would someone want to serve on the review committee? I have a responsibility not just to the future generations, but you know, I look at my sons and I think I have a responsibility to them to be able to say that you know, your relatives are home. It's important, I think, in the sense that it fulfills the spirit of NAGPRA, which was intended to fundamentally address a set of civil right issues that extend back over uh, hundreds of years and are intended to uh, not only address those issues but to establish a new kind of relationship among universities, museums, federal agencies, and, and federally recognized tribes. For review committee meeting minutes, procedures, findings, and recommendations, and reports, as well as Federal Register notices announcing meetings and soliciting nominations for membership, log on to the National NAGPRA Program website. Thank you for watching this segment on the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Review Committee. I hope you can better understand the work performed by the committee and how the committee might be able to assist you with the NAGPRA compliance process. I guess I want to say thank you to, to Congress for giving us NAGPRA. And I say it, <laughs> I say it in a, a weird way because I, I say it laughing like that because there's, there is criticism in Indian country of NAGPRA. But, um, and although I will sit here and tell you about the 123,000 sets of ancestral remains that haven't come home and this work that needs to be done, I can also tell you about you know, the other sets of remains that have come home. 
and so and, and setting this process um, into place. I think it's humbled me a lot because I had a lot of assumptions about what I thought I knew as an archaeologist and as a scientist and as a woman. And, uh, it has humbled me. I've been privileged to take part in events that I never would have imagined taking part in. And I've built some deep, lasting friendships. And it's really helped me to gain empathy for understanding belief systems that are not my own. And that's what's really, I think, important in a struggle with this is that I've heard so many times people say, well, what's the big deal? If it were my grandmother, I wouldn't care. Well, the big deal is it's not your grandmother, it's someone else's grandmother, and they do care. You know, and so I think building empathy is, and under, cross-cultural understanding has been pretty pivotal for me. The last reburial I did was, it was January. We just got the remains back. It was from a disposition. And I was like, oh man, I don't want to have these hanging out in my office all winter, you know. So I got my snowshoes on and uh, threw them on my back, you know, and I had this shovel and I was like trekking through the woods and I was like, I hope the ground's unfroze. If not, I'm going to have to start a fire. But luckily I started digging and the ground was unfrozen. You know, it's just like, cool, you know, you feel really good. You know, you're reburying and, and the remains were all kids, you know, just like little itty bitty skulls and just little guys, you know. And they're from right down where I grew up in Mackinac City, which is like 20 miles from Cross Village. So this is like real personal. And it's like felt really good, you know, it's like I did something good today. You know, this is like something I can be proud of. I call my mom and she's all happy. Tell other people, I was like, oh, that's, that's a good thing. So.